this week on the Back Table Podcast. We really enjoyed having like the the urologist perspective on this kind of stuff because it drives interventional radiologists like crazy, like talking to like other urologists. And and what I've what I've told people and sometimes what I tell my partners is, you know, sometimes like I mean every specialty has assholes and, and every specialty has people that are going to dump on you. It doesn't mean it's a specialty jumping onto you. It's just usually a couple pricks in the bunch. Um, and, and, I and think, we have know, a unique scenario where I, I, we kind of have a, you know, I see my interventional radiologist like every day in the lounge and sometimes I need them and sometimes they need me. And it's just kind of one of those things where you don't want to dump on somebody in that scenario. I think the frustrating part is probably, you know, you get into one of these big groups and you're the re- urologist who covers that hospital and you, and you have rotating IR guys, you can just dump on them all day long. Cause you <laughs> yeah. don't really have a, yeah. a relationship. I think this happens in like bigger medical communities where, you know, you know, it's, it's like, you know, have you have multiple urologists, multiple interventional radiologists, and none of those guys know each other. Hey guys, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things IR and endovascular. I'm Chris Beck, and I'll be your host today. Um, per usual, we are always on the lookout for more feedback. So if you guys have some, reach out to us on the website. The address is www.backtable.com, or hit us up on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at underscore backtable. Again, don't forget that underscore. Also, a uh, quick word from the sponsor, which is RadPad. Guys, RadPad was developed by physicians for physicians, clinically proven radiation protection during CINE and DSA. Don't bet your career or your health on anything less. Trust RadPad protection system shields for all your fluoro guided interventions. If you guys want more information, go ahead and check out radpad.com for more information or contact info at radpad.com for a free radiation evaluation and what they call a no-brainer radiation protection cap. If you guys do reach out to them, please let them know that you heard about this on the Back Table Podcast. It'll help us out a lot. So with that out of the way, let me reintroduce a uh, guest that we've had on a prior podcast when we talked about renal masses. Today we have interventional radiologist Shelby Bennett and urologist Arthur Kerr. Guys, welcome back. Thank you. All right, so we'll uh, just jump right into it. Uh, the topic today is is urosepsis. Um, real quick, guys, in case someone who uh, is a new listener hasn't uh, listened to some of the old podcasts, will you go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your practice? Arthur, we'll start with you. Uh, this is Arthur Kerr. I'm a urologist in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I do general urology as well as kind of specialize in minimally invasive uh renal and prostate surgery. Okay, nice. Shelby, how about you, man? Yeah, Shelby Bennett, vascular interventional radiologist, predominantly in Santa Fe, but my group covers essentially the whole state. Um, I do neck-to-toe vascular and non-vascular procedures. Okay. There, like, just to give Arthur some background, is there's a, a connect forum, like an online forum for interventional radiology where people go and, and kind of talk about issues that are in their community. And, and one of the things that came up recently that was, was a hotter topic than I ever imagined was, you know, what patients are appropriate uh, during the middle of the night for percutaneous nephrostomy versus double J stenting. And so the, the whole crux of the whole discussion is which patients end up with a double J and which patients end up with uh, a perk. And so what kind of, you know, get into that topic, but that's, that's the whole crux. And so Arthur, starting out with you, um, you kind of described your practice a little bit. How much of your practice would you say involves uh, kidney stones um, and specifically within that subset kidney stones that are are causing uh, potential uh, urosepsis? So it's pretty much a a daily or, you know, certainly weekly, um, situation I'm in. I, I currently practice with one other guy in the area and and there's not a whole lot of urology coverage in the state in general. So we, you know, are seeing this kind of day in, day out, um, very common presentation to the emergency room here in our community. And we also cover about 
uh, four to five other hospitals in the area because of no urology coverage when we are on call. So again, we're getting a big population feeding into our institution, which commonly have obstructing stones. Wow, that's huge. So if I heard you right, it's about six hospitals that you're covering when you're on call? Correct. Through, uh, you know, not directly, but we have a transfer center and none of these institutions have urologists. So through the transfer center, they're all feeding into our institution. Okay. So when you're on call, you know, say on, on over a weekend that this is almost something that comes up each night or almost every night? Yeah, I mean, maybe not every night, but, you know, certainly there's not a week goes that goes by where you're not going to run into a, you know, some type of obstructing infected stone. Okay. Uh, Shelby, how about you? Uh, when I'm doing on-call uh, hospital coverage, uh, I'd say like once a week, um, I evaluate a patient for possible percutaneous nephrostomy. What about, uh, or, or what of the times when you see and evaluate a patient is this something that it's like, this is a urology, urology thing, I'm going to handle it, and, and which patients do you say, okay, maybe this is something more appropriate for a perk? So, I mean, it, it all comes down to the patient's condition, um, as well as, you know, comorbidities and, and things like that. I think, uh, you know, you have a hypotensive patient who's tachycardic and high temp and obstructed, I think... Um, this is a patient that's going to benefit from a, a nephrostomy tube. Uh, but what we run into a lot is, you know, a patient who is kind of, you know, not hugely sick, but not well. And that's really where you kind of get into the decision of, um, you know, who's at, at best to serve this patient. Okay. And, and digging into that a little bit more. So, so let's take uh, the patient who is uh, floridly septic. So um, label blood pressure and, and, and just, you know, doesn't really pass the eye test whenever you walk in and see them. Um, but they have something like a three millimeter stone. Does stone morphology play into this with you? It very doesn't. Much? So even that's the common thing, you know, there's stone size and then there's infected stones. Infected stones are, you know, infected and it doesn't matter what the stone size is because these are going to be treated completely differently. So even a three millimeter stone that's obstructed that can cause somebody, you know, a horrible issue with sepsis, et cetera. So the size doesn't really come into the algorithm. It's really, do they have an obstructing stone? You know, are they infected? And then what do they look like clinically? Okay. Shelby, how about you? How about in terms of when you're asked to go evaluate a patient, you know, what are some of the things that you're looking at? Or if, or if it reaches your level, is it by that time, you know, if, if they've called and woken you up in the middle of the night, or, are you just ready to pull the trigger? Or do you still go in, check out the patient, and then have some kind of conversation? I feel like if you're consulted, you should see the patient. Um, you know, you can't see all of them, especially if you're covering multiple hospitals and all that stuff. But if you can go see them, it's always better because what people tell you on the phone and what you can see on the computer is a lot of times different from what you see face to face. So if you, if you appear at the bedside and the patient looks acutely ill and a little bit unstable and you can get this done quick, then you probably ought to do it. And so it's ultimately how the patient looks and who can get it done the quickest and the safest. So in terms of stone morphology, you know, if the patient is stable, uh, they've had a fever, they're on antibiotics, they've got a, uh, a big stone in the collecting system like a staghorn, and it's, uh, it's a non-distended collecting system, I'm going to call urology and say, hey, can you, can you do this guy? Because I think it'll be easier for you than, than for me. But, um, you know, if, if urology has, has failed, uh, then I'll still do, a, you know, an undistended uh, collecting system with a staghorn calculus. But in general, um, the stone morphology doesn't make a big difference other than that. Okay. And uh, Arthur, going back over to you, um, in terms of, of that stone morphology, you kind of said that, you know, a three millimeter infected stone doesn't, I mean, that doesn't play into the algorithm at all. So, and, and you'll, maybe this is just me not knowing enough about the topic. So, if you have a patient that's that's got a blown out renal collecting system, but like a four or three millimeter stone at the UPJ, it's like you putting up a double J stent doesn't decompress the area. 
No, it it'll decompress the area. It really just depends on again the um, acuity and overall clinical picture of the patient. So, I'd say the majority of these patients are you know not going to decompensate uh, quickly, and they're healthy enough where you kind of initially resuscitate them, give them some antibiotics, and then they can kind of get their uh, ureteral stent placed in uh, whenever you know throughout the next 24 hours. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally, you're just going to see somebody who has probably been sitting on it for a while at home and then comes in completely decompensated, and that's going to be your kind of nephrostomy tube uh, uh, candidate. Okay. Uh, one of the things that was brought up in one of the SIR forums, and, and this is kind of a technical question, maybe getting a little bit into the weeds, in terms of the double J stint that, that you place, do you have access to like different sizes? I mean, I'm not talking about lengths, but the actual size of the the double J, and will that vary from you know a patient who you're just seeing for you know non uh, uh, basically a non infected picture versus a urosepsis Eurocess- picture? Uh, not really. I mean, typically I'll use like a six by you know twenty four, twenty six, whatever, or seven um, by twenty four, twenty six, twenty two, based on the patient's height or the the length of the you know ureter. But as far as different stone, uh, stent sizes for different uh, pictures, typically not the case. The one thing I will do is, is leave a catheter in um, just to decompress the area completely in mm-hmm. kind of a, a septic picture just to you know, set low pressures and allow things to drain appropriately. But as far as stent size, I won't change it a whole lot. I guess the, <laughs> other, the other consideration is you know, with the stent versus nephrostomy is the effects of anesthesia in an already potentially septic patient. Yeah, so that's actually that's actually a fantastic question. So um, let's let's segue into anesthesia. So Shelby, um, what is is your kind of work up in terms of like looking at someone like from an anesthesia risk perspective and going prone and and what do you use as far as like keeping a patient comfortable either from local or do you feel the need to knock people out? Like what, what's your kind of take on these things? In a patient that is, you know, not combative, it has a, a non-altered mental status, moderate sedation is is often plenty. Uh, you know, once you start getting into the combative patient or altered mental status or hemodynamically significant, I'm, I'm sorry, or hemodynamically unstable patient, um, then uh, you would you'd want to seriously consider anesthesia in that case. Okay. And in your case, Arthur, I presume that if, if you're putting up a double J, everyone's under MAC or GA? Typically general. Occasionally we will do a MAC if somebody's really, uh, you know, unstable or has a lot of comorbidities. But, you know, 99% of the time they're going to be under general anesthesia when we're putting a stent up. Okay. And so whenever you're looking at a patient and evaluating someone out of the ER, whether or not you think they can tolerate GA versus moderate sedation kind of brings you to a, a branch point in terms of your decision making. Is that what you're? Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Pretty much. I mean, I, I think that's the main branch point as far as stent versus nephrostomy is in these just uh, you know very ill labile patients. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but once you kind of get that past that, then it's really more of just. W- you know, who's available, the relationship with your IR doc, uh, how you kind of go about things at your institution. And I think that's probably the, the frustrating part for interventional radiologists. If you have a, somebody who's covering, you know, I'm sure they kind of potentially dump on the interventional radiologist at times versus it just depends on your community and, and kind of the politics involved. Yeah, I would say that that is that that is the sentiment, and and some places aren't as uh, collegial as other places, and then sometimes you know you're operating in such big medical facilities that not everyone knows each other, right? And so you know you may be getting a referral from a urologist who you don't know, and so maybe the trust isn't there as opposed to in, in tighter knit communities, which which um, at my practice that we actually have, and that if something's getting referred to us, we feel pretty comfortable that it's not a dump and that that patient's been thoroughly sussed out. And every now and then I'll admit that I've been called in the middle of the night to do a perk and the urologist was, you know, he just put it out there. He's like, look, I think I could actually do this guy, but you know, and he just kind of leveled with me and he's like, but he'd really be doing me a huge favor either. You know, he's getting burned up with something else that's, you know, pulling him in a couple different directions. 
Um, but but drilling down a little bit more on on patients who you think are going to be good candidates for double J stents, and I, I know that you said stone morphology doesn't really matter. Are there any patients where you look at and, and the stone is in a certain location or the stone's a certain size that you think, wow, this is going to be a bear of a case? Not really. I mean, typically if you're not in that acute scenario, pretty much, you know, I try a double J stent on anybody. Occasionally you'll just have such an impacted stone that's been there forever or, you know, something weird going on where you can't get it, um, whether they have you know, a huge median lobe of the prostate or some difficult access into the ureteral orifice or some mm-hmm. type of scar tissue. But typically I'll, I'll try and fail in those scenarios prior to, you know, consulting interventional radiology just because, again, most of these things you don't really know about until you get in there. I see. So, and I've always just had it in my head, always, and I've never heard this from a urologist ever in my life, always assumed maybe UVJ stones would be particularly difficult because you – you're just in a point where you really can't get the wire, the instrumentation into the ureter. But I guess that it really either UVJ, mid ureter, or UPJ. It's it's kind of just every every patient can be different, and it's hard to predict who's going to be tough and who's going to be you know when the wire is going to fly. Pretty much. I mean, there's a couple little tricks depending on where it is. You know, if it's really impacted at the UVJ and they're not you know septic or anything like that, you can just take a little laser and bust it up a little and then you get your wire and your stent in it just depends on kind of the whole scenario and length of time with the stone and whether they're infected or not and a lot of it's just you know when you get in there whether it flies or not okay that's fair let me ask you um this shelby do you find that you've gotten a fair amount of consults whenever there's an ultrasound done and debris ends up in the renal collecting system. Do you find that that's, that's, those ones are, are patients that are more often than not getting referred to IR when, when there's a concern for pus in the collecting system? Uh, you know, that's not really been my experience. Um, and I'm not sure if that's a, a, a product of, of where I've practiced, but um, I, I truly feel that when I've been consulted, uh, except for maybe one or two instances there's already been due diligence, and I, I don't feel like debris um, in the collecting system has affected my my consult rate. Okay, how about you, Arthur? Is that is that something that wherever you whenever you see um, debris within the collecting system, and you think it, it's going to be a pussed out kidney, where you're like, oh, that this is just better for a perk in general, and, and the thought process being that that it's been explained to me by by urologists in the past that. Um, potentially a double J stent is going to have a harder time decompressing this collecting system because it's going to get gunked up with just a bunch of pus. So, um, you know, I would agree with that. It just depends on the case. Very rarely is that going to be the case. Also, I I pretty much never would recommend treating just off an ultrasound. I think you need a non-con CT for these things to really figure it out. But I can tell you a, a case last week, actually, between an IR guy at my institution and myself where had a 30-year-old uncontrolled diabetic who came in with just a horrible-looking kidney and, you know, kind of pus in the collecting system. And, um, you know, we kind of had a debate whether to put a a stent versus observe versus um, to put a NEF tube. And ultimately, we ended up sitting on it because the interventional radiologist didn't want to put a nephrostomy tube in, and I didn't really feel like a a stent would be that... uh, beneficial for this patient. Uh, it was also complicated by, you know, renal insufficiency and possible uh, chronic renal insufficiency. So it's tough to tell what the, what the right thing to do is on some of these patients. But rarely, I will say that if you have a lot of pus in the collecting system, I do think a nephrostomy tube is a better option. So Shelby, getting to that, what size nephrostomy tubes do you put in if uh, or actually, maybe you can just watch, walk us through a little bit of your technique. If if you're able to get some pus back or you have suspicion, like a high either from imaging or you get a little pus back in, in the AccuStick set or whatever you use to access, do you, does that change your algorithm as far as like what kind of what size nephrostomy tube you're going to use? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing in the world is placing one of these tubes and getting called back four hours later. Hey, we're not getting anything out of the tube sure. now. Nothing in the drain bag. Patient's still febrile. So um, you definitely want to kind of um, adjust your approach as you go. Um, in general, mo- I think most people are placing 8 to 10 French pertnefs, and, and that's fair in most cases. 
Um, you can you can certainly err on the bigger side if you're getting out some thick or or sort of like a mixed urine and debris. Uh, you can go up from there. But but I think I think an eight to ten French kind of going with an eight in a more typical. Uh, you know, uh, urine uh, drainage situation and a 10, if there's some debris, most of the time will get you what you need. Okay, that's fair. So Arthur, just going on on, on when you get these referrals and, and what are some of the things that you do to start the the management of this patient that doesn't actually involve the, the two things that we've talked about, percutaneous nephrostomies and, and double J stents. Like, are there some things that you're, you help out with the emergency room as far as conservative measures, whether it be fluids or, or classic antibiotic coverage? So I'll be honest, the majority of the way these situations go down are, you know, the, the emergency room doc or the essentially reaches out to make sure you're available, and then that patient is uh, admitted to the hospitalist, kind of they do the resuscitation, the admission, and then they're pretty much teed up the next day to undergo stent placement um, is kind of our our typical uh, protocol. And I, I think as hospitalists have become more kind of mainstream that I, I would say most urology practices are kind of, you know, they, they give you a quick call, give you a heads up, and and for the most part, these people aren't super acute. I mean, majority of them, you know, a little fluids, a little antibiotics, and they kind of perk up and they can, you know, rem- wait till the morning in order to get their stent placed. Very rarely um, do they decompensate and are going to be ICU admitted and things like that. And, and fortunately or unfortunately for interventional radiologists, that's the ones that who really need the nephrostomy tube. The other thing, I, you know, with stent placement that we didn't mention is that the stone manipulation with the wire and things like that can sometimes lead to, you know, further uh, decompensation, spread infection, and things like that. Another advantage for uh, a nephrostomy tube placement. Sure, I guess the less manipulation and less mucking around to, in you know, incite and stir up, the, you know, whatever is is kind of locked in the the kidney. No, I get it. Um, and and actually, going back to your earlier comment about. How some patients, like or a majority of patients, can wait, and some of these guys can be teed up and done the next day. That's a super reasonable thing to say, and I just wanted to acknowledge that briefly. Um, Rarely do but, I think any of these ever get a neph tube or a stent in the middle of the night. I mean, I think the majority, vast majority, are going to get resuscitated and you know dealt with in the morning. I can think very. I can't really think of a scenario where even our interventional radiologist is in in the the middle of the true middle of the night doing this. I mean, occasionally you may get an early evening or early morning, but very rarely is somebody going to be up at three in the morning, putting in a, a nephrostomy tube. Sure. Sure. Shelby, how about, would you echo that sentiment? Is that a majority of these patients can, can wait until the morning or if it's something that's a late consult during the day that you you'll go in and then maybe it's an early evening case versus cases that, you know, you may have to do at 2 a.m. or something. Yes, by far, by far. I mean, you don't want to hear about this at 5.15 p.m. and then you go sleep on it um, because, you know, unless you go see the patient and you feel that he's responding or she's responding appropriately. But in general, if you hear about this patient, you know, late afternoon, like Dr. Kerr said, it's probably better to go ahead and do it um, if the patient looks like they might get sick. Uh, But if if it's truly middle of the night consult, you know, based on um, clinical eval and vital signs, a lot of times they will respond to conservative management and you can kind of do it like a first case add on. Sure. Sure. All right. Again, so, uh, moving into final comments, is there something that we didn't cover guys or maybe some stone left unturned, uh, Arthur, anything we missed? So I would just say, you know, where people get into trouble with this is multi coverage. As far as, you know, you push it off, then the next guy comes on and he pushes it off. That's when you're really going to get a sick uh, individual and a, a really bad outcome. You can, a septic stone can be a disaster. I mean, I've seen one case of uh, a stone that got pushed off and, you know, they were on so many pressers, they lost extremities and things like this. So it's it's something not to be taken lightly, but, you know, if you have a, a good relationship with your, you know, your your interventional radiology colleagues, and you and you make sure that these patients are addressed and and taken care of in a timely fashion. That's rarely going to happen, but um, it's one of those things that 
you know, 99% of the time it goes great, but there's that 1% of the time that if you're not on it, it can lead to, you know, a disastrous outcome. Sure. Absolutely. I think one of the most important things that we've kind of talked about, and, and this is maybe a recurrent theme and a lot of the thing, a lot of the topics that we discuss is that having a good working relationship with your referring providers so that everyone's on the same page and it, it, it's a lot less likely to feel like a dump whenever you're talking to someone whose opinion you know and trust. And, and to Shelby's point that he actually made earlier is that, you know, if you get consulted in the middle of the night or late in the evening or something, you're on such more, you're, you're such stronger clinical ground if you go and see the patient. Um, I have an old attending that always used to say that it's really hard to say no or yes to anything when you're, when you're you know, doing the phone call from your bedroom. Um, Shelby, any, anything that you'd like to add? Uh, no, I, I think, well, maybe I would just say, uh, second, what, what, what you both have said, that it is important to know who you're working with, to have a good relationship and at least open communication with uh, the services who are consulting you and you are consulting. Because, you know, if, if you take a new job or you come out of training and you go to an environment that you're not super comfortable and you get a consult in the middle of the night uh, or any time to do uh, a, a JJ or a perk nef you might reflexively say, oh, this person is, you know, should just take care of this. But, but what you might not know is maybe the person who's referring to you at this new hospital where you're working isn't comfortable doing that. And maybe they feel like it would be dangerous. Maybe they don't, they don't do a lot of perk nefs or they don't do a lot of JJs in patients who have had uh, some sort of surgery, X, Y, or Z. So I think, um, yeah, open communication uh, with all the different services and good relationships. Know who, know who you're working with. That's all really important. Yeah, and maybe one piece of this puzzle that you know we're really not talking about, or, or somebody whose pe- perspective that is not included in this, is the emergency room. You know, the guys who are on, on kind of the front lines and and are seeing like the spectrum of patients who are, you know, just with flank pain versus the people who are floridly septic. So it might be worth talking to those guys too. Yeah, um, good, good, um, good ER staff, good hospitalist and ICU um, uh, physicians can make all the difference in the world because they can tell who needs to be. Uh, you know, consulted on at three in the morning and who can be appropriately managed medically until you get there for first case. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, hey, I have a question for you guys, uh, yeah. kind of an IR specific question. Sometimes I'll get pushback on, you know, kind of a, a non-dilated collecting system and, it, you know, are, are not a hugely dilated connect, collecting system. In fact, that case I was talking about with, you know, the, the pus in the kidney and the diabetes, et cetera. The reason we ultimately didn't put a tube in um, was because the system wasn't dilated enough. What are you guys' thoughts as far as putting in a frostomy tube and maybe a, a, a not completely dilated system? It, Shelby, I'll let, I'll let you go first, man. Sure. Um, it's, you know, it's, it certainly can be more challenging if you're using uh, ultrasound and fluoro, which is what most people do. A non-dilated system can be really frustrating and I think that with perk nefs and non-dilated systems, like a lot of stuff that IRs do, you have to be cautious and you have to be patient and be willing to sit there and try and stick multiple times and, uh, and, and, and recognize when you see that you're in the non-dilated system. Uh, that being said, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is tough. And, and depending on who you're working with, if they're not comfortable with that, they may, they may be creating a more dangerous situation for the patient. Um, you know, so, uh, it's, it's definitely something that I've done. It's definitely something that's routinely done, but it's more challenging. Yeah. I will echo, uh, Shelby's sentiment in that what a non dilated or minimally dilated system to me, actually, really, it's just the non dilated systems that, that I hate that it's a more difficult procedure. It is for me, at least in my hands, more likely that we're going to get into a, a bleeding complication, whether mm-hmm. that's because of me or whether that's because that's just the nature of a non-dilated system. I don't know, but I, I suspect that there's some interventional radiologist. And I think that we get into this pretty often is that it's kind of a commodity, like a perk nef is a commodity, but really there's, there's a whole range of skill sets with different interventional radiologists. And I think that some people know that in their hands, that the procedure that they're getting asked to do is, is stretching their skill set. Um, but that being said, in, in my mind, like in the Euroseptic patient, whether the, I mean, it's, it's oftentimes the system is at least somewhat dilated that um, I think a, a perk nef, if um, whether it's minimally dilated or, or super dilated, that 
I'll, I'll go ahead and, and give it a try. And, and basically when I start, the reason I've always said that IRs are so successful is because there's no one there to back us up. I mean, if, if you don't get it, then the patient doesn't get decompressed. And so I just won't quit until I'm in. And, and luckily that hasn't been, you know, some kind of outlandish fluoroscopy times or outrageous procedure times. I don't know if that's been your same experience, Shelby. Um, I would like to say, yeah, that I've uh, avoided the long fluoroscopy times and, and that sort of thing. But every every now and then you fail, uh, but you do go try and, uh, you know, minimize radiation dose and, and contrast and all that stuff. But I think most importantly, uh, you know, have a, have a plan, be cautious, be patient, and 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 be willing and able to manage any complications that may come. So if somebody, uh, you know, is not comfortable approaching a, a, a non-dilated system, knowing that it could be a longer and more frustrating case, maybe they don't, maybe they're, they're not wanting to do it because they don't feel comfortable managing a potential bleed with an embolization, you know? So, so I think you have to be comfortable managing the complications that you would see. Absolutely. Arthur, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think, I think truly in this scenario, it probably is a, a comfort level, um, type of situation. And, you know, every, you know, you know, what I find is every interventional radiologist has different skill sets and di- different, uh, ability to take on risk. And, and that's also ultimately what you have to do to figure out, uh, you know, what you can do depending on who's on call. Yeah, Absolutely. We really enjoyed having like the the urologist perspective on this kind of stuff because it drives interventional radiologists like crazy, like talking to like other urologists. And and what I've what I've told people and sometimes what I tell my partners is, you know, sometimes like I mean, every specialty has assholes and, and every specialty has people that are gonna dump on you. It doesn't mean it's a specialty jumping on to you. It's just usually a couple pricks in the bunch. Um, and, and, I and think, we have know, a unique scenario where I, I, we kind of have a, you know, I see my interventional radiologist like every day in the lounge and sometimes I need them and sometimes they need me. And it's just kind of one of those things where you don't want to dump on somebody in that scenario. I think the frustrating part is probably, you know, you get into one of these big groups and you're the re- urologist who covers that hospital and you, and you have rotating IR guys, you can just dump on them all day long. Cause you <laughs> yeah. don't really have a, yeah. I think this happens in like bigger medical communities where, you know, you know, it's, it's like, you know, have you have multiple urologists, multiple interventional radiologists, and none of those guys know each other. All right, guys. Well, I think that covers it. Uh, covered a lot of good ground today. Really good discussion. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, got value from the podcast and want to support the show, here are two really easy ways. First, take two seconds, press the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. It just helps these platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're putting it out. Second, if you're really getting a lot of value from these podcasts, we really appreciate it. If you go to iTunes, leave us a short written review. It helps us in a lot of different ways, and we really enjoy the feedback. I guarantee you that the, the guys on the back table team, we read every one of them. Um, but that, guys, uh, that, that wraps it up. We'll see you guys next time. Uh, Shelby, Arthur, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.